Well, let's jump in the scripture. We're looking at Matthew 18 today. If you want to turn there in your Bibles or your app, if you're joining us online, uh, we're glad you're here. But it's a, a delight to be with you this, this morning. So Matthew 18, we're continuing in the More Than series. You can look for it in here, but let's read this together. Matthew 18, we'll be starting in verse 12, going through 14. So what do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that any one of these little ones should perish. Amen. So this is Jesus. He's speaking to his disciples um, and thinking about this message as a pastor. You know, you want to bring, for interpretation's sake, your experience and knowledge about the subject to the, to the verses as we talk about it. So I want to give you a little bit of my background with sheep and my experience uh, in shepherding. In my bedroom in the top drawer, I have several pairs of wool socks. <laughs> That's it. I am an end user of sheep. I have no experience in shepherding them and raising them and caring for them. And most of you probably are in the same boat, right? We're not living in ancient times where shepherding is a thing that looks like our daily lives. And so coming to this passage, it's familiar. You want to come to it honestly and, and kind of slowly, recognizing like, I don't have a ton of personal context for this. <clears throat> so as Jesus is talking to his disciples and telling them this story as an illustration, he asks the question, what do you think? What do you think? And so I ask myself that. What do I think? If someone had 100 sheep and one went missing, wouldn't he leave the 99? And my answer is, well, I don't, I don't know, do you? Like, this isn't my framework and context. This is not something I'm familiar with. But I know that Jesus in other places has told people familiar stories and then done a twist at the end to get their attention and to wake them up from the familiar. And sometimes he's been hyperbolic and told stories that would catch their attention because they're, they're a little extreme. Is that what's happening here? Or would the disciples say, well, yeah, you would go after the one. What do you think? And my answer was, I don't know. Because if I think about it in terms of numbers, you have 100 and one goes missing, 1%, 99% and 1%. In school, if I came home with a grade and handed my report card to my parents and I got a 99, it was high fives and fist pumps, right? If my kids come home with a 99, I'm like, that's great. I don't care about that 1%. That's just a tiny little percentage. So for my modern experience, there are a lot of ways where that tiny percentage of loss just doesn't seem like a big deal. If you uh, own a grocery store or something with, with products like fruit and vegetables, there's a percentage of loss that happens in your business just as a matter of course. That 1%, there's, there's a loss. There's a loss in lost product. In a retail environment, there's theft, there's unsold goods. Um, even just talking to someone earlier, if you have a car, you buy a new car and you drive it off the lot, there's this loss of value immediately. There's so many ways in our context where if you think about like n you have 99% of something, there's an acceptable loss of 1%. That's not a big deal, right? If you think about it economically or in terms of numbers, that's my experience. Is there's, that happens all the time. What's the big deal? Of course, the economics change depending on what you're talking about, don't they? Because if what you're talking about is a field trip with third graders, <laughs> right? You know, and you're in charge, and the third graders and their chaperones go out and do whatever it is they do, when they all come back before you get on the buses and you start doing a head count, one, two, three, four, and you only get to 99, you're like, okay, hold on. Let me recount, because they're, they're squarely, they're third graders, they're, they can't hold still. And you count again, and again, you get to 99, and then you start thinking, okay, well, hold on. Hey, guys, can, everybody hold still. Everybody help me count. And everybody counts, and everyone gets to 99. Suddenly, the economics of 99 and 1 change rather drastically, don't they? And then everything that was planned from here on out for that field trip suddenly is suspended. Those kids are just as valuable. 
as that kid, but the state of that one kid has changed, and he is lost, and everything is set aside because there's a desperate situation for that one kid, that one percent, because a human being is not an acceptable loss. And so in this story, he's not really talking about sheep, is he? He's talking about us as human beings, and that for all the people that are in the flock, that are with Jesus, that have a relationship with him, there's a percentage that there are people that are lost. And, a, and the shepherd, in fact, as I did some research, a shepherd would go after that 1%. He would corral the sheep that he has, and they would generally stay in place. They're a herd animal. And he could go off and look for that 1%. The economics change when you talk about human beings. A human being is not an acceptable loss. So Jesus is talking to his disciples in this passage, and if you look at the context, <clears throat> you know, he's asking them that question and then, and then proceeding to his answer. But uh, for context, if you back up in the chapter, at the beginning of chapter 18, verse 1, let's read the question that the disciples asked that led to this discussion. So let me read that in 18, 1 through 4. So it's the disciples with Jesus. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put, them in the midst, put him in the midst of them and said, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So if you know your context, the disciples, they're followers of Jesus, they have been with him for some time, doing ministry with him, seeing these amazing things. But they know the Old Testament. They know their history. And they're, at least to some degree by this point, they're realizing, like, there's this predicted king of Israel. David was promised that one of his descendants would reign forever. There'll be a Messiah that comes that institutes the kingdom of God. And they're thinking, it, it's, it could be him. Like, this is the kingdom coming, especially attractive to them as people under occupation of Rome and not in control of their own government and situation. And so the disciples have been doing ministry with Jesus and seeing who he is and what he can do, and they're anticipating this kingdom of God. And with that, the realization that they're on the inner circle, right? This is not the first time this topic has come up with the disciples. They're not naive to what's going on. In fact, there were some potentially embarrassing moments, if you're familiar with the Gospels, where one time they're walking along, and then later Jesus says, what were you guys talking about on the road? Oh, which one of us is the best? <laughs> right? Like, they know what's going on. And so as they think about the kingdom coming and that they're on the, the, the inner circle of the king, they're starting to ask questions about, like, well, how do I rank compared to, to this guy and that guy? What kind of position of authority and power will I have where will I, what's my stance? What is my position here? And so they, they boldly ask him, and Jesus answers them, right? He, he pulls a child, and he, he says, hey, who's the greatest? Well, the greatest is this child. And a child had no rights. He had no privileges. He wasn't even, you know, in their eyes, a fully developed person yet. And a child is a dependent. They are not okay on their own. They are dependent on someone else. And so they're in a very humble state, in a state of being led. And he says to them, you, if you, hey, you want to you wanna be great in the kingdom? Then you have to become like this. And it's interesting that Jesus, nowhere in the New Testament does Jesus chastise his disciples for this conversation. That when they're wrangling about, like, I, I want to be great. I want to do great things. I want to have a... He doesn't say you shouldn't want that. He doesn't tell them to kill their desires but rather he redirects their desires for greatness to do it in the kingdom way. That it's about service, it's about emptying yourself, it's about humility and letting God be great. But the disciples are, are asking that question, and it's interesting that as you think about that, that, that they want to think about the great deeds that they will do, and Jesus is redirecting them to say, like, it's not about your great deeds and the kingdom of heaven, it's about your great need for the kingdom of heaven. Because he answers their question, but not until verse 4. His initial answer to the question happens before that. When they ask him, who's the greatest? Listen to the, to the switch that happens. 
he turns the conversation or the topic. He says, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of God. And so Jesus is reminding his disciples as they think about the kingdom and their position in it, that yes, that's true. Yes, you're my disciples. Yes, there's a kingdom coming. But that's not the critically important part right now. The bigger question is entrance into the kingdom. And it's super important. In fact, it's the mission. And you guys are losing sight of it. That the mission is entrance into the kingdom of God. And that you can only enter if you recognize your need for a savior. So Jesus goes on from here. When he talks about entry, he raises the stakes for them. And if you read through the rest of the chapter leading up to our verses, he starts to say some things that really make it a black and white issue and raise the, the importance of it in the eyes of his disciples. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because from there he says, like, so speaking of these little ones, listen, like sin is the problem. Sin is the chief concern right now because sin separates you from the kingdom. And he gives several illustrations that says, like, Sin is such a problem, like, if you were to cause these little ones to sin, it would be better for you to have a millstone hung around your neck and be thrown into the sea. Extreme statement, but he's making a point that there's something severe, life and death going on. And he says, like, it would be better for you to cut off a hand or a foot that causes you to sin to, and then enter into the kingdom than to go to destruction on the whole. It would be better for you to pluck out an eye and go one eye short into life than to go on to death. And so Jesus is reminding his disciples, like, yes, there's a kingdom coming, and yes, there are positions to be had, but it's through service, it's through humility, and the reason I have come, I have come to seek and save the lost. That for those who have been brought into the kingdom, it's not now about where I rank, but it's about bringing more people into the kingdom and helping the lost to be found. So I grew up in central Pennsylvania. Um, I have an older brother, 14 years older. He was off to college, but it was my sister and my mom and dad. And we often would go to Hershey Park in the summers. It was a favorite place. A lot of you have probably been there. Um, so when I was about 10 years old, don't remember the exact age I was, but we went to Hershey Park, the four of us, and I think at that time, the pirate ship was new. It was like new, amazing technology, right? The pirate ship, do you guys know what that one is? Do we have that? Yeah, there it is. It's not, it's not quite that like out in nature. It's at the park. But if you're not familiar with the pirate ship, it basically is a giant pendulum, and you're on the bottom of it, and you swing back and forth pretty high up, which if you're under 20, brings you moments of delight and weightlessness. And if you're over 40, hours of nausea. That's where I am now, sadly. I'm still okay with roller coasters, as long as I have a line between them. So the pirate ship, so we went and, and we wanted to ride the pirate ship. It's later in the day. It's probably like an hour, hour and a half before the park closes. And we, you know, you get in the turnstiles and, and the, the cattle chutes and you wait your turn. And then we were up, um, the line keeps going, and we got to a point where it was almost full but not quite. And there wasn't room for all of us, but there was room for me, and I was in the front of the line. And so they're like, just go ahead, we'll see you after. So I got on the pirate ship, did the thing, got off the pirate ship, at which point your 10-year-old mind, you know, all the hoses aren't connected yet, and your logic is not fully there. The logic for me was, I am now separated from my parents. I should go back to my parents. Where did I see them last? Back in the line. And so I walked around the pirate ship and back to the line and scanned the crowd, and I didn't see them, so I thought, well, then they must have walked around the other side. They're on the pirate ship, John. They're riding it right now, and you should wait. That didn't make the connection for me, and so thus began my search for my lost parents. And after doing a couple laps and increasing the radius of the laps, I did not find them, and this emotion began to grow in my heart, this feeling of, like, I'm separated from my parents at this park. You know how I felt? I was mad! I was so mad because I have an hour and a half less at Hershey Park, and now I have to go on a hunt for my lost parents. I'm missing roller coaster time. This is an irritation to me. So this is my 10-year-old attitude. I don't know what that says about me now, but, you know, so, but what happened was 
I wanted to reconnect with them. I knew I needed to, and so I began looking for them and retracing my steps through the park, widening the circle, and I just couldn't find them. It was crowded. But you know what? I passed multiple, multiple times the red caboose. If you've been to Hershey Park, the red caboose is the place where lost kids are brought by the staff or parents who have lost children go so they can radio out and everybody can communicate and you get reunited with your kid. Never went there. Passed it all the time, knew exactly what it was for, but I didn't go. Do you know why? I knew where I was. I had a map. I was familiar with Hershey Park. I was not lost because I knew where I was positionally. You know what I'm saying? I knew where I was. I am not lost. I'm fine. I just need to reconnect. I'll figure this out. Here's the thing about being lost. You can be lost for quite a while before you ever even realize it. Because a state of lostness doesn't necessarily mean you don't know where you are, but it's separate being separated from where you need to be, from your provision and your protection and an inability to get back to it. And so I was lost at Hershey Park but did not realize that I was in trouble yet. Had the park closed and I still didn't find my parents and I didn't get to go home that night, then the severity of the situation maybe would have dawned on me. For my parents though, it was a mad search. And they found me eventually like as the park was getting close to closing, Crowds thinned out, I was a lot easier to spot. And all was well. I'm sure my mom's hair was whiter as a, as a uh, byproduct of that experience, if you've ever lost a kid. Incidentally, some of you have experienced great loss, and I don't want to move past that too glibly. You've lost loved ones, maybe recently, or even lost children. You've experienced hardship and pain. And as a pastor, I don't want to just move through that unawares that Jesus cares. The Father knows what it's like to lose a child, to experience loss. He can sympathize. Lean on him for comfort. So you can be lost and not realize it. So the reality for a sheep in that environment, as we're kind of turning back to Jesus' illustration, is a sheep in Israel, as I have read and people have told me, is actually a very vulnerable creature. So the terrain is rocky. There are cliffs and there are bluffs, blind corners. There are predators, lots of like vegetation. Sheep can get easily caught in things with their wool um, that they cannot extract themselves from. They can fall. Um, I was talking with somebody who actually raised sheep for a time between services, and he said sheep are like super dependent on their shepherds. Even if a sheep gets caught on its side, it will die from organ failure because it's, it has to be upright. Not to mention a, a whole host of other things like food and water. In a dry Middle Eastern setting like the disciples knew, water was hard to come by, and a shepherd would know where to find it. But sheep won't even just drink any water. They really don't like rushing water. They're afraid of it. They won't drink from it. And so the shepherd would have to guide them to a pool that is more calm and still for them to get a drink. And in that environment, they need water on a, on a regular basis. And food was hard to find. All this to say, in Jesus' illustration, the disciples understood that to be lost as a sheep, to be separate from your provider and your protector, the clock was ticking. The sheep would not be long in the world. It was in dire, dire circumstances. And so that's the illustration Jesus is drawing as he talks about the severity of sin, that there's two options, you're rescued or you're lost, that that's the state that he's reminding the disciples that this isn't just about like where you rank. This is a rescue mission. I've come to seek and save the lost, and the stakes are so very high for those who are lost. So if you're the 99%, a lot of us in here, I would say, probably we'd say, hey, I'm, I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm in, I'm in the fold I'm in the group, I'm at a church, I follow him. You know, we, we aren't lost, we've been found. All of us begin in a lost state and are found as we heed Jesus' call. But you know, for us as, as people who are followers of Jesus, sometimes we get our nose down so low to the ground looking for the next thing that we forget to notice where the shepherd is. And maybe you're in that kind of situation now where life is just full and busy and I don't really have time for a quiet time or Bible study. 
I just have the next thing. Where's the next thing? What do I need? Or you're bumping into other sheep and just becoming irritated with them or fighting for resources that are scarce or distracted by something off in the distance and you start moving toward it. You know, there are a lot of ways that we as the 99 tend to stray away from the shepherd. And so let me encourage you, this is primarily about people who are lost and need to be rescued. For those of us who are rescued, we still need to keep our eye on the shepherd. We still need to trust him for our provision and our protection. Lift up your eyes and see the shepherd if you're a follower of Jesus now. Do it regularly. Stay close. Avoid some hardship that may come your way if you're drifting. So apart from the shepherd, a sheep is doomed. It's just a matter of time. And as you think about this passage, you know, what Jesus is doing is he's revealing a little bit of the heart of the Father. And he says, it's, it's not the will of my Father that any of them should perish. Like, he doesn't want that to happen. A human being is not an acceptable loss. And a shepherd would, in fact, go after that one sheep because the situation was desperate. And the beauty of the gospel, the beauty of Jesus being Emmanuel is it runs parallel with the story in that the shepherd with the sheep on the mountain, when he realizes one is gone, takes care of them. They're good. That shepherd must go down and enter into the situation that the lost sheep is in. That he must himself as a shepherd face the dangers that the, the sheep is entangled in, the predators, the thieves, the geography, the potential for a fall of being lost himself that a Middle Eastern shepherd would have to descend the mountain into a dangerous situation, into a, an unpleasant situation. And that tells us something about Jesus, doesn't it? That as a good shepherd, that he is willing to enter into our mess, the mess that we've made for ourselves, the mess of sin, the mess of a broken world and all the difficult things that we experience. Jesus is willing to get in there with us and as Emmanuel, as God incarnate, that he came to the world, that he himself is great because he humbled himself so completely to take on the form of a servant and even to die on a cross for our sakes, that he entered into our situation in order to be our rescuer. And so many of you, I believe, have, have heard his calling to you, have allowed him to lay down his life for yours in order to rescue you. But the heart of the Father is that not any of us should perish that he wants to bring you back into relationship with him. He wants to know you. He wants to protect you and care for you. And I know, though, that, that some of you here in a group this big, some of you do not know Jesus in that way. Some of you might be like me in that amusement park where you recognize, I'm fine. I think I'm fine. I don't need Jesus to rescue me. I'll just do my own thing. I'll play by the rules. I'll, I'll, I know where it's at. I have it all mapped out. I know my way around. And so you might not realize that you're in trouble yet, but all of us must give account to God, and sin has separated us, that we're lost already. It's just a matter of time. Or some of you maybe realize maybe now that you're in some trouble, that you've come up against some things in your life, a difficult circumstance, a situation with your job or your family or your health, where you're seeing, oh, I can't get myself out of this. I might need someone to help me, ultimately. I might need God in this situation. And some of you, perhaps, are lost and you want to be. Maybe you've experienced some thieves and robbers posed as shepherds that have come in and have like given you a bad sense of what a shepherd is. Don't judge Jesus by the people around you. Judge him by his word and see him for who he is. Compassionate shepherd who wants you in a relationship. So I don't know where you are today in terms of your relationship with God. Some of you, many of you are followers of Jesus. Look to Jesus on a regular basis. Do the things that keep you close to him. Gather together in groups and keep your eye on the shepherd. Let him lead you and feed you and protect you. But if you're here today and you say you would say, I don't know Jesus in this way, it's just a group of rules, or I have a bad taste in my mouth, or even you're in trouble, today is a great day if you hear Jesus' voice calling you 
to say, I am, I'm here. Come and rescue me. I need help. And to rely on his goodness and his kindness and his willingness to enter into a broken world with us to rescue us. So if you don't know Jesus in that way, I pray that you would have a conversation with me today or Pastor Rob or out at the blue wall. We would love to explain to you what that means and how you do that. But just wanted to remind you as you think about this passage that the heart of the Father is not that we are punished or crushed, but that we will be rescued. He does not want us to perish because he loves us so perfectly and he wants us with him. And so I pray today that you would heed that call wherever you're at, that you would cry out to Jesus and that you would entrust your life in his because that's the only way that we will ultimately have life. Let me read one more verse. John 10, Jesus is talking uh, about himself as a shepherd. And he says this in John 10, 14. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. So Jesus was willing to give it all to come and to rescue us, to pursue us and lay down his own life for ours. And I pray that you would remember that, that you would worship him and put your life in his hands. And if you've never done that, you can do it soon, even this morning. So Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that you are the good shepherd, that you love us with an unending, uncontrollable love, and that you recklessly come after us. Oh, Jesus, would you have all of our hearts say yes to meeting with you today, to being our shepherd, you being our shepherd, and to being our rescuer. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this worship. Amen.